Deserts. Oh. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Chain of Commander, your source for general chit chat on the Commander format. I'm your Commander Chief Billy G here, coming back to you today with this month's episode of the Base of Operations, the segment where we take a look at your mana base to figure out ways. It could work for you harder. Back when I started the series, I really honed in on uh, Snowlands and the ways they can improve your deck synergy. Well, today we're going to go to the opposite end of the temperature spectrum. Thermometer, if you would. And we're going to look at deserts. Not desserts, un unfortunately. Now, before we get into this, I will say, if you end up enjoying this sort of content definitely consider subscribing below. I would love it if you could join us going forward. If you've already subscribed, thank you so much. You guys wouldn't believe how much that means to me. And with that said, let's get into this. Back in Arabian Nights, Wizards released their first, and at the time, only desert card. This was a land simply labeled desert that uh, did one or two things. It either tap for colorless mana, or it tapped to do one damage to target attacking creature after combat damage is dealt. This was so powerful that they printed several cards that cared about this particular desert. The most powerful of those was Camel, a 0-1 with banding that uh, when it attacked, it and all things that was banded with it had protection from this almighty desert. Obviously, maybe maybe they kind of underestimated, overestimated certain effects back then, but uh, luckily they decided to go back to the desert concept back in the Amaket block where they released 19 more deserts. And these are arguably significantly more useful. Let's start off by kind of going over these 19 deserts that Wizards did release as part of Amaket, uh, starting with a cycle of deserts with cycling. Uh, these entered the field tapped or tapped and then tapped for their respective color or you could cycle them for one and their respective color from your hand to draw a card in case you were flooding out. Uh, there were also five colored mana utility lands. These would tap for colorless or you could pay a life and tap them for their color. And they all had their own activated ability where you can pay a mana cost, tap it, sack a desert to do an effect. Uh, Chef at Dunes, which gave your creatures plus one plus one until end of turn. If New Rivulet, which lets you mill target player four cards. If Near Deadlands, which lets you put two minus one minus one counters on a target creature your opponent controlled. Grammy Nap Ruins, which did two damage to each of your opponents. And Hash App Oasis, which gave target creature plus three plus three until end of turn. So a little buff there. Now, like I said, these, these abilities required you to sack a desert to activate them, but they did not need you to sack themselves. So you could repeat them considering you have enough deserts to do so. Beyond these five or 10 deserts so far, there were also two mana filters. There was Painted Bluffs, which you can pay one and tap it to produce a mana of any color. And there were Survivor's Encampment, which you can tap an untapped creature you control and tap it to produce one mana of any color. And there were seven colorless utility lands Cradle of the Accursed, which you could pay three and sack it to get a 2-2 zombie. Dunes of the Dead, which when it goes to the graveyard from the battlefield, produces a 2-2 zombie. Endless Sands, which you could pay two and tap it to exile a creature you control. And then at some point you could pay four, tap and sack it to bring all those creatures back to the battlefield. Kind of like as a way to protect your, protect your creatures from removal and whatnot. Grasping Dunes, which lets you put a minus one, minus one counter on target creature by sacking it. Hostile Desert, which was a creature land. You can exile a creature card from your graveyard to turn it into a 3-4 elemental to get those beats on. Scavenger Grounds. This is a land I've talked about several times before because it is nice graveyard hate. You can pay two and sack a desert to exile all the graveyards. And then you have Sunscorched Desert, which can do one damage to any player when it enters the battlefield. 
There's also several cards that care about deserts. They printed more efficient deserts matter cards in the Ammon Cop block as well. Uh, they had Chef and Monitor. Now, Crows and Tusker was a pretty popular card because you can cycle it to get a land from your deck into your hand and also draw a card. For Chef and Monitor, it can get a desert or a basic land from your deck onto the battlefield untapped at instant speed. So you can cycle it, get something like, say, your Scavenger Ground, and activate it all at instant speed just in case your uh, graveyard buddy there is getting a little bit too ambitious with his game plan. You have Hour of Promise. If we look at something like Explosive Vegetation. Got to me. Took me a moment there. Costs three and a green to get two basic lands to the battlefield. Tapped. That's it. Seeds a fair amount of commander play. For one mana more, for four and a green, Hour of Promise lets you get two of any lands. So let's say you got to finish your Tron deck, or if you're playing black, you can get your Cabal Coffers and your Urborg. And then if you also have three deserts on the field when that spell is done resolving, you get two 2-2 two, two zombies. So that is ramping two and a potential of four power and toughness for five mana. That is a good rate. Unquenchable Thirst. This is one of those blue tap-down auras. Uh, you see them in a lot of sets, but normally they're at the CMC 3 or 4 mark for removal. This one only costs two, one and a blue, and as long as you control a desert, that creature does not untap during its untap step. Seems like a pretty good value. And uh, you also have Desert's Hold, which you, everybody knows pacifism. This is like pacifism up a notch, because this also stops activated abilities. So, some pretty decently costed Desert Matter cars to get removal-style effects, ramp-style effects, and stuff like that. Pretty okay in my book. Now, there are definitely decks that care about deserts, or maybe not necessarily care about deserts, but really benefit from having deserts as part of their mana base. Uh, the first one I thought of when I was doing this list was Titania. She wants to see stuff go into the graveyard. She wants to see her lands go into the graveyard so she can make 5-3 elementals. Deserts do exactly that. You are sacking deserts to pay other deserts mana, their effect costs and stuff like that. So you will be putting lands in your graveyard over and over again, making a whole bunch of 5-3 elementals. Then um, mono red decks. One of the issues with mono red decks is that they quite often don't have reach. They get off very quick, but then they can putter out, especially if people start board clearing their goblins and stuff like that. With red, they get Ramunap Ruins. So they can sack a desert to do two damage to each opponent. That's six total damage from one activation. So if you have enough deserts, or if you have something like Crucible of Worlds, which lets you play deserts from your graveyard, you could be doing six damage to the table every turn and have that little bit of oomph you might need to finally finish off the table. Also for Mono Red, specifically Zozu the Punisher, or maybe other commanders that are more land destruction oriented, when you're destroying everybody's lands communally, everybody at the table is paying this price, you can use the deserts, or specifically in this case, I guess, Dune of the Deads, or Hostile Desert, to really take advantage of the fact that you have deserts, you're putting deserts in your graveyard. Uh, you can use your... Hostile Desert to get in for the beats, or you can use the Dune of the Dead to get a 2-2 zombie when you end up destroying it, just coincidentally, from your land destruction. I know people don't like playing against Zozu. I have a Zozu deck. I think it's sometimes fun to be the baddie. Keep an eye out for the deck, to, to, uh, the deck tech next week. I'm pretty pumped for it. Um, but yeah, you also have, in those cases, you have uh, access to Cavalier Thorns. Not Cavalier Thorns. Cavalier Flames, which cares about the amount of lands in your graveyard when it dies. Synergies like that. Synergies will really benefit having deserts because deserts natively put lands in your graveyard. Boldrotha. Boldrotha is a very popular commander. I think she's probably been the most popular commander over the past two years. Ipnu Rivulet. That is the blue activated ability one that uh, mills target player four cards upon its activation. That is in 6% of decks for Boldrotha, according to EDH Rec. I think that's really low, because in a Moltrotha deck, if you target yourself with that mill effect, it's essentially draw five cards. You get the four you mill, and you get the Ipni Rivulet in your graveyard, and you can just 
do it again next turn. You could recurse it. And it's just bonus draw. Excellent to help kind of fill up your graveyard for a Muldrotha deck. And there's a bunch of other graveyard decks, uh, Salti graveyard decks that really want their graveyards full. So those would also really appreciate maybe this Ipnu Rivulet from being played. Uh, some people also play Cephalic Coliseum, so you can have like another a functional duplicate of that. And the last one I have for you here are our colorless friends. Friends. Your Emrakuls, your Kozileks, your Ulamogs, your Traxos. Things that don't have access to colored answers to a lot of effects. In colorless decks, a lot of these decks are essentially free inclusions. They produce colorless mana. They don't enter tapped. They do what the deck's doing anyways, but now they add a layer of utility. It gives access to a little bit of graveyard hate, a little bit of token production, like let's say you could toss a Field of the Dead in there, uh, stuff like that. And essentially a free spot in the mana slot for a colorless deck. So definitely another deck type and archetype uh, color identity or lack thereof that would definitely appreciate the use and inclusion of these deserts in the deck. So I hope I gave you enough information today to kind of at least think about it. Deserts are some of my favorite land types, and you quite often see many of my budget lists include what I call the desert package, especially in mono and two color builds. If you're hitting up the three colors, there's no dual deserts. I know when I did my Snowlands video, I did mention the five ally tap pairings for the Snowlands. Deserts don't have anything like that. They only have the two filtering lands really to produce multiple colors. So if you have a three plus color deck that's really mana color intensive, Desert's probably not going to be the thing that you want in there. But if you have a one to two color deck, Desert's can very simply just slide right in there and add a fair amount of utility to your mana base. So that's all I have for you today. I'm willing to hear from you. I want to know. Down below, let me know. What do you folks do with your deserts? Do you play them? Do you not play them? Have you not thought about them? Do you think that this is something you consider playing? Definitely let me know. I want to know down below. And like I said earlier, while you're down there, if you're not subscribed yet, definitely consider doing so. I would appreciate it greatly. I would love it for you to join us going forward and beyond that. Thank you all for joining me today. I'll see you again in the future. I have an overabundance of desserts that I got to finish off. Take care.